All right, thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, this is our second event in the Demythifying Los Angeles screening series um, put on by the Park Film Center. So before I introduce our guests, Mariana da Silva and Miguel Arteta, the director of Star Maps, which we will be discussing today, I'm just gonna give a quick background of the Echo Park Film Center and, and what we do and a little bit about this program. So my name is Nicole Yuseto. I'm the programmer for today's event and the co-op member at the EPFC. Um, Echo Park Film Center or EPFC is a co-op run media art space. We're about 20 co-op members and we now have multiple branches. Um, so be, besides our Alvarado location, which is like our brick and mortar and original location, we also have a location in Vancouver at the Moberly Fieldhouse, which is called EPFC North. Um, we have a new one popping up in Long Beach called the Long Beach Community, Community Media Arts Center. Um, and then this, this is kind of part of Alvarado, but we do the EPFC Filmmobile, which is, this program's actually part of that. We bring itinerant cinema all over LA County and beyond. Um, and so this, if it weren't for COVID, would have, you know, hopefully have happened in person, but we've adapted things based on the um, environment of the time. So usually with the film mobile series in the summer, we like would project the films in the neighborhoods in which they were filmed at. So like Star Maps being filmed in Hollywood could have taken place there, but now we just have to imagine. So hopefully the, the second half of this program as we continue to plan more films will take place in person, we'll see. Uh, besides itinerant cinema, EPFC provides free film classes to youths and seniors, affordable film workshops for adults, an artist in residence program for local artists, and an international artist in residence program. Um, we also have a micro cinema where we project films in house, um, usually Thursdays and Saturday nights. Hopefully, that will also open up again soon once restrictions ease up. Um, and we are now open for for rentals for equipment. So we also have a store at our Alvarado space where you can get camera gear, like analog gear, digital, and we also um, do telecine services. So this series, Demythifying Los Angeles, um, has been something I've been working on for a while, I've been doing research on different films based in LA, Latinx cast and crew. Um, we received special support for this program through the Academy of Motion Pictures and Arts and Sciences. Um, and originally we were supposed to start in 2020, again, pushed it back because of COVID. So, I hope that you all tune into our future events, especially if you like Star Maps, which I loved and I was so happy to rewatch. <laughs> um, it was so awesome to program this film. So I'm gonna quickly introduce Miguel and Mariana and then I'll pass it on to Mariana to um, moderate the Q&A. And if anyone has any additional questions, just drop them in the YouTube chat and I will read those to Mariana. So Miguel Arteta is a Puerto Rican filmmaker living in Los Angeles. He studied film at the Wesleyan Film Program with Jeanine, Jeanine Passenger. His first three features, Star Maps from 1997, Chuck and Buck from 2000, and The Good Girl from 2002, all premiered and found distribution at the Sundance Film Festival. And Mariana da Silva is a Brazilian Mexican writer and actress who lives in Los Angeles. She's also the founder of El Cine, a curated Latinx 501c3 nonprofit organization whose mission is to provide accessible, inclusive film education through monthly screenings and guest conversations. Mariana has appeared in telenovelas and TV series. Her credits include El Rostro de Analia, Las Dos Caras de Ana, and NCIS. She's an active member of Tim Robbins' highly acclaimed The Actors Gang. And in 2020, Mariana, Mariana participated in CBS's diversity writing program and her short film, Mari Mariposa was screened in festivals worldwide. Awesome, so that's just a little background about who's joining us here. So please, if anyone has questions, just drop them in and we'll be here at the end. All right, I'll hand it over to you guys. Hi everyone, I'm so excited to be a part of this conversation today for a film that I really loved. Um, I was lucky enough to watch this a long time ago and then rewatch it this week. And boy, do I still love it so much. Um, Miguel is absolutely one of my favorite Latinx directors. I've been lucky uh, to meet him a couple of times and we've shared in our love for cinema that is inclusive. Um, and this film, Star Maps, which I hope all of you got the chance to revisit if you hadn't seen it in the past to experience it, uh, is so special because uh, 
Miguel, it's your first film, correct? And um, one of the things that I love so much about it is that the film is a tragedy, is a comedy, it has fantastical elements. And I just wanted to start off this conversation with your inspiration. How did this film come to you? And uh, just tell us a little bit about your writing process on this. Um, it, it was my first film. I was a student at the American Film Institute in 1990 through 1993. And uh, I wanted to uh, write a feature and the inspiration sort of came from my, from the dynamics of my family. They're not autobiographical. My family is not involved in such horrific exploitation as this. But, uh, but you know, I, I tried to write something autobiographical. It came from a place of pain. Uh, uh, my father at times was, uh, 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 you know, a little bit sadistic with us. And, uh, um, and I also, from my impetus to try to get into Hollywood, you know, it's, it's a, it's, it really is a movie about a young Latino kid that wants to get into the industry and how, how far is he willing to go because of the damage that he has experienced as a child, he's willing to do things that are not good for himself. Uh, but uh, but the, 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 the father uh, character was the first inspiration that came to me. I, 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 you know, this person kind of honoring someone who's kind of sadistic, but you know, a little complicated, maybe does he care or does he not care? And uh, I had an image of him in the hammock playing uh, a guitar and just cheerfully being a little bit mean, mean-spirited mean humor. And uh, out of that, uh, the whole idea was born. That's one of the things that I love so much about this film is that I feel like personally, I, I think I relate to it so much because personally, I also came from a family that I was like, who are these people? <laughs> um, but, uh, Nothing like that, but we'll say that one of the things that I think is so true to Latinx experience is the loyalty that you are expected to give to family. And I think it, this film explores not only the loyalty to the toxic, toxic aspects that you sometimes have to break away from, but also then you have the Teresa storyline, which is a very necessary, beautiful loyalty that Mari, who I love, um, you know, that is, taking care of her mother, but still very stuck in her own situation. Um, I think these things are very relevant right now, but back then I feel like they weren't. And that's why I think when I saw this film a long time ago, it really moved me because I, it made me feel seen in that experience. So I love hearing that. Um, and I wondered, I mean, this is probably a, an interesting question, but do you think Mari then stays in that bubble taking care of Juanito or is that something that you didn't even, you were just like, well, that'll be open to the interpretation. I, I felt like it should be open to the interpretation. Okay. Uh, um, but I, I was hoping that there'd be some compassion towards her and even towards the brother who's, who's kind of creepy and scary. Uh, you know, they're just damaged people uh, that, that suffer a lot, you know, from a really heavily dysfunctional family. You know, and uh, as, Latin, as Latin people, we don't have a, you know, a monopoly on dysfunction. Everybody has dysfunction. And so like, uh, um, I wanted to portray that. And at the time, this is movie was, you know, being written 25 years ago, the movies for Latinos were like either movies that were very necessary to show how Latinos were good people you know, that portrayed differently than you see them usually in the media. Things like uh, Stand and Deliver uh, uh, and, um, and La Bamba and, and Mi Familia, things like that. Or you had movies that uh, just traded on the stock of Latinos as gangbangers and, you know, uh, and dangerous and criminals. And so I was like, there's gotta be sort of freeing ourselves of those extremes, you know? Like, uh, can we just make a movie that just deals with like, a family that could be any kind of family and they happen to be Latinos? Yeah, and I think that's one of the things too that makes it feel so beautiful because of the amount of stories in here, right? You have these micro stories that are happening and I think that that's what's so effective as well about the film is yes, you have this troubled character that's a pro it's a generational product that could be of any family right of a dysfunction that gets passed on and people 
not necessarily doing better than their parents, not just following along. And I mean, making the assumption that that's what Pu Pepe was. Um, but it, it's, it's one of the things I love so much is the fact that you're telling several stories and I, and then you tie them up with a bow and some of them leave you sad, uh, tragically, and some make you feel really good. Um, and it kind of feels like a love letter to Cantinflas as well. Were you always a big fan of Cantinflas? And I, what I love about you, Miguel, is that I feel like you're writing and then you have this thought where you're like, I'm going to put Cantinflas on the moon. And you just go and you do it. And it's beautiful and it's such a treat. Um, so were you a big fan always? I, I always liked him. You know, I couldn't understand what he says because he spoke so fast and he, sang, <laughs> he speaks so fast that, you know, he would speak uh, 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 circles around anybody and make them do anything. But uh, yeah, I, I loved him as a kid a lot. And uh, I, I just wanted to give the mom something uh, beautiful to look after. I'm obsessed with the moon and the moon program. So the idea of being, just the idea, the idea of being able to rent some spacesuits was like very exciting to me that we could have some on set. Uh, so um, I really uh, what, wanted to do that for that reason. But you know, uh, you talk about having many characters and many stories. I, I just, I don't know the people who are watching, if you're filmmakers or you're trying to make a, a feature film or your first feature film and, and, I, and advice I can give, you know, cause at the time I had things that, seen movies, independent movies like Clerks where, where, where was, it was the wisdom of the day. If you want to make an independent movie, choose just one location, two characters, keep it super simple so that it, the budget is small and you can just afford it and do it. And I tried to bang my head and do that. But, you know, like the story that was born in my heart had all these characters. And so I ended up with nine main characters over 40 locations trying to shoot in, in, in 35 millimeters. It was totally the wrong idea for the first film. Uh, uh, made my producer, Matthew Greenfield, who, who now, by the way, is running Searchlight Films, um, uh, uh, crazy. But, but this is what I want to say to the people listening is like, you really have to write about something that you feel you're going to learn from that comes from your heart that you can put your heart in and characters that speak to you that you're going to be, you're going to be excited to go and shoot every morning. And if that makes it for a, you know, a very unshootable film, there's always a way. I love that so much. Uh, it's, it's just a joy really. And then it also stays with you, you know, in a deeper way. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk about was this idea of demythifying LA, which is what this program uh, is, is centered around. And one of the things that I really, really love is um, I feel like in my, I, you know, I lived in Miami for a while. In Miami, Latin people are everywhere, right? In LA, there's this weird thing. If you're on the East and you gradually move to the West, you lose the culture, right? Yeah. Um, and the culture is so present. And I wonder if that was something, cause I really felt that in the film. And I wondered if it was something that was um, something you were focusing on or rather that it happened organically. Um, it happened organically out of the story. Uh, I mean, when I landed here, I was excited to come to LA because I was an aspiring filmmaker. And, uh, and then I saw the kids selling, you know, I did notice, I was like, where are the Latin people? I realized uh, it, even in Hollywood at that time, there, it, it, there weren't that many visible Latin people. Uh, you know, there were bus boys, uh, there were, you know, in the kitchens and then there were these kids selling maps to this and, and they were mostly all latinas and um uh and i was like this is a weird feeling that you know uh the the most visible latinos are standing in the corners selling these dreams you know like do you want to see where this the, the, the movie started live and I, uh and i and i thought this is interesting there's got to be a world there for me to explore um and uh uh and they were very, very, they were in every corner at that time, by the way. I know they're not there anymore because of the internet, but uh, they were, you know, they were a really popular thing for, for decades. Um, so, yeah, I, I was wondering about LA being like, you know, because I heard that it was half Latino, but it didn't appear that, that way when you landed. Uh, and it wasn't until I started going to East LA that I, I started to realize, oh, it's, it's actually a, a oddly segregated segregated uh, city. Um, 
it's getting more and more integrated, but um, you know, um, the systemic racism that, that we've been talking about since Black Lives Matter, it's, it's been, you know, uh, very evident in a city like this, you know, where you have the, you know, yeah, in the West side, there is so few affluent Latinos and uh, uh, it's, uh, it's still like, you can, you can feel how even the dynamics of the city are divided towards an unfair, um, uh, you know, it's just, you know, we're, we're not supporting all uh, communities equally. Yeah, and, I, and I, I think especially when we talk about schooling and programs that are available, and I think that's why places like the Echo Park Film Center are so important um, and bringing awareness to them um, because yeah, it's, it's, these are the things I think that become a, a big fall short. And again, same thing, right? When you land particularly, it's, it's very shocking. For me, it was very shocking because um, I, I didn't expect it to feel that way. Um, one of the things too with this film that really, I mean, one thing I wanted to ask is where's Letty's apartment? Where did you guys shoot that? Because boy, do I love that apartment. That apartment's really nice. Is that, you know, the Yamashiro restaurant? Yes. Uh, above the Magic Castle in Hollywood, yeah. in the middle of Hollywood. That, that, that whole complex next to the, 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 the restaurant has this row of apartments that they rent that have beautiful views of the city and, and beautiful decks. And I think they were there, uh, you know, used for actors in Hollywood as uh, that for people, you know, back in the 30s and 40s for people that, that were coming from out of town. Um, and uh, that was the, uh, an apartment from a friend of, uh, of the actress that played Letty, uh, Annette Murphy. Uh, every location was somebody like allowed us to use for free, you know, because uh, all of our budget was, was uh, put into our film stock. Um, and it, it, was, it, was, it was fun to be up there, you know, up on the hills in, in that apartment. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's really beautiful. And, and going into the intimacy of the film, one of the things that I love so much about it is that it is centered around, you know, somewhat around sex and, um, but it never crosses a line where it becomes uncomfortable. I feel like that's something that we see now so much of, um, it, we see so much more now, I feel like, but this film is still very, uh, playful and sweet uh, and but then you also know when it's not which is something that I think we're talking about more in this day and age right and one of the things too is this idea of this woman who's very beautiful and this young impressionable guy and you really show the times where it is consensual and times where where this kind of casting couch idea is is starting to happen yeah. and you do it so beautifully and I wondered when you were writing it, were you like, because I, I would imagine that you would think, well, somebody's a guy that's impressionable, a beautiful actress, why wouldn't he want to? But I think it really speaks of uh, the sexual abuse that a lot of people face in this industry. Um, and how did you, what would be your advice to somebody who's trying to capture that and turning a relationship from consensual to maybe uh, an abuse of power? Well, you know, it's interesting because I think a lot of, a lot of, I mean, there, there, there are abuses, uh, abusive sexual uh, relationships where the power is just like used, you know, and, and like there's no black and uh, no gray areas, it's clear as, but the majority of these things happen in gray areas, you know, and, uh, and, and that's why it's so difficult to identify and, uh, and to discuss. Um, uh, uh, without naming any names, I, I, I was in a relationship with an older woman, uh, uh, who had contacts in the film industry and uh, who uh, could help me in some way make, make movies. And, uh, uh, and it was consensual at, the, at, at first, but then after a while I realized I, I was being used and, you know, uh, and, you know, uh, I really thought it was, you know, I wasn't seeing myself as using, using her to get somewhere. I thought it was a mutual thing that we had a passion for film and, and we, we both were, you know, having an, an affair. And, uh, but then it crossed this line where, you know, when I was, you know, I was always told by her, like, you can always, you know, you're too young, this is nothing. 
at any moment, you can back away from this, you know, you need to be with people your own age. And then when I tried to do that, it was like, no, you know, if you don't do this, then I won't support you at all. Like, um, and uh, it became a, a, a weird and, you know, where I felt I was being uh, uh, in some ways, uh, what's the word, um, you know. Manipulated or. Yeah, it's an abuse of power. Now, you know, an interesting thing about the movie is that like people don't talk about women abusing their power to, for sex that often with men because it happens so much less. Uh, but, you know, I definitely can say it does happen too, you know, because this came from real life. Yeah, I think that's one of the things I love so much about it, because I also think it's something that isn't talked about enough, you know, and um, these power struggles do happen. And uh, yeah, it's and I think particularly in this industry, there's uh, exactly like what you said, there's a gray area that sometimes it tips over and, and uh, it's not great, obviously, t terrible. Um, no, but uh, I mean, any uh, uh, when someone uses an advantage to have over somebody else, it's always an, and and the problem is that people that have advantages over other people uh, uh, tend to you know it's easy for them to take it to 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 use that advantage in a, in a way that's unhealthy and it's something that we all have to watch uh, on not only for sexual and abusive like. Uh, relationships but for any kind of uh, uh, sort of uh, you know if, if you have an advantage over somebody you need to be very very conscientious and kind uh, and uh, and when people who have advantages over you are not doing that you need to be very aware of it um, and uh, I think the movie was a little bit of a cry you know me getting out of that relationship and trying to free myself uh, you know I was not a, I didn't know how damaged I was for many years, you know, like I didn't have a, a physical relationship for over two years. I didn't let anyone actually touch me or hug me much uh, during that time. And it was, it was uh, something that I saw as I wrote the movie, I think it healed me. And this, this is the best kind of writing when you're like trying to understand something, not be the, uh, I, again, if anyone's trying to make movies, I recommend this, don't try to be the expert of your screenplay, of your characters, of your world. Try to pick something that you really are struggling with and you just have an active earnest interest to investigate and get, get more of a handle on and try to do the process of writing as a way to getting more of a handle on the issue. And I think this film really healed me. Um, I ended up in my first relationship uh, 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 after the film and it was very, very healing uh, uh, to also understand, you know, I wrote part of it as to, you know, the, the relationship between Carlos and Letty, the, the father's uh, girlfriend, where, where she, you know, Letty really understands how uh, damaged he is sexually. And like, uh, even though she's being told to go exploit him, she has a sensitivity towards him that it was my wish fulfillment that I dreamed of. I was like, I want, I hope I can meet a person like this that would understand, that would ask permission to kiss me that would ask permission to touch me, you know? Um, even though in the film, it's, it's all uh, framed by a very sick, uh, you know, they're, they're, they have two rich people from, from the West Side watching them have sex, but this very beautiful thing is happening in the middle of, of that trick. I do love that it's very, uh, that's what I feel about it too. It's done very beautifully. And I think you can sense that watching. I mean, I, I believe that's the power of movies. Not only do they have the power to heal the viewer, but they also have the power to, as because I do think when it's a good movie, you're watching someone process something. It's the same thing with acting. I feel it's like you can, you can through someone else find your peace and, uh, and then when somebody watches it, they can then find that for themselves. And it's kind of a tag, a tag you're it to healing, um, which, is, which is, I really feel it in this film. Um, and again, I, I wanna just stress how seeing those family dynamics for me was so incredibly healing as well. So you also have that aspect in the film. And obviously this cast is fantastic. Um, so incredibly real and, also, another thing I love about what you do is I always feel like you cast people 
who really feel like people you would know. Um, so I, I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about who they, how you found them, the casting process, where some of these, I'm imagining some of these um, actors were maybe first time actors, um, just because looking them up, um, so I'm, I'm just intrigued. Well, we, um, um, you know, we held, it was non-union, so we put an ad on, on backstage and uh, we were casting here out of Holly, uh, out of Silver Lake. One of our uh, investors had a nice house and we were doing it out of there. And we cast it for a long time. You know, we did like four, six months of casting to try to find the people. And it was, it was hard, especially finding the father was very difficult because you had to find somebody that understood to have the power of the abuse, but who really understood it. And um, thank God Ephraim Figueroa showed up uh, uh, who just really got it. And, uh, and you know, also, uh, uh, you know, finding Carlos was Douglas Spain, you know, he, he was an aspiring actor. I think at the time he was working um, at, a, at a car parts shop, uh, delivering car parts. And it was so beautiful to, you know, because he dreamed of acting. I mean, in some ways he shared a lot of what the kid did. And, uh, and he had that beautiful face and understood to do very little, you know, like, which was wonderful. I wanted somebody that where we would reflect our own story into his uh, sort of somewhat mysterious face so that people lean into, into his performance as opposed to him trying to telegraph things to us. He has a really wonderful sort of mysterious, delicate touch where you, you, you don't know what he's exactly thinking and that's, it's, uh, it's exciting. But I mean, there were so many good actors, you know, Annette Murphy, who sadly she's, she's deceased. She passed away a few years ago. Um, her sister, Karen Murphy is an incredible producer, produced Spinal Tap and many, uh, 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 many other great comedies. Um, uh, she was incredible, and uh, Candice Jensen is also like was quite a fine, you know. Like uh, she, uh, I didn't know how incredibly funny she was at first, but she's like seeing the movie years later, I realized how funny she is. And this is what's wonderful when you, as a director, you have to use your hunch to cast people. Like you don't can't use your brain. You have to like actually just use your gut. To be is this the right person to tell the story? Do I feel it? Do I have a hunch about it? Don't listen to arguments you can talk about where they check all the right boxes but at the end of the day they have to be in front of you and you have to have a hunch and you know Ephraim who's playing the abusive father and Candace is playing the, the abusive movie star in writing the film I feel like I, I found some healing but in play in, in finding them and watching how they play the film I found out uh, a lot of understanding towards why people abuse you know when you're in a position of living that kind of abuse, you can't, you, all you see is, you know, you just have hatred towards once you realize these things are happening. But when you put a story in motion and you cast actors who embody this, they start to tell you, oh, well, I had reasons, you know, like the father is like saying, you know, it's a hard, very tough world out there. I'm just trying to toughen you up. I'm doing this for a good reason. And that's, you know, and I learned that by, that didn't come to the research. I learned that by watching Ephraim Figueroa play him. And I, I learned that my father probably didn't mean badly either. He had his good reasons for what he was doing. And watching Candace also is like, she's like, you know, my life is fun and I just want this kid to have sex with me. And like, why not? I'm gonna give you something in return. It just seems like a natural, really great, you know, transaction. I'm doing nothing wrong here. And, uh, and I realized that the person that had abused me probably doesn't, you know, had all this, he didn't see it in any way as an unfair situation. But you can learn that by telling stories and you can learn that by also finding the actors that really speak to you. Yeah, and, and I wonder too, because I think, like I said, it's, you have this amazing ability to, uh, make these films that are incredibly moving but also some you know somewhat eccentric and just beautiful really um and i i wonder what your advice would be because i feel like the industry becomes more and more about 
putting people who are names in your film to sell them and uh, doing these things to make your film more marketable, particularly. But I would imagine that that kills some of the creative process. And I feel like you are so loyal to your specific voice and your specific vision. And just like you were saying about your hunch, how would you advise uh, new filmmakers on sticking to their hunch and not throwing away ideas of let's put these people in a space suit because that's going to be awesome. Um, what advice would you give for that? Well, I, I think you, you have to listen to the, um, you, you first of all have to realize that the, the power of your own experience and your observations on how other people are, uh, it's, it's, that's your biggest weapon. That's the biggest currency for telling a story. Don't try to imitate anybody. You know, when I was starting, like uh, the marketing team was like, oh, we're going to call you the Latino Tarantino. And I was like, what? Like, uh, you know, like I've made big efforts to, to, to try and uh, not try to imitate anybody. No, uh, don't try to imitate anyone because like the, what we look for in stories is people's observations of how other people are. Uh, or, or how they are themselves, their honest expectations. So write down all those weird peripheral thoughts that you have all day long when you are interacting in the world, the little things that you're like, I'm embarrassed to think this, or, oh my God, I can't believe I noticed that. All those kind of details are the things that your point of view that nobody else has. And that is your biggest strength in telling a story. Don't think about what people might like. Don't think about what has worked before. Think about what your own real life experience is. Just take a notebook with you and write down like weird, weird stuff you notice. Now, out of that, you know, you're, you're a story that nobody else could tell will be born. That's beautiful. I'm here taking notes and I hope that the viewers are also <laughs> doing it because it's great to hear. If there are any questions, um, please let me know and we will get to those. And um, yeah, I wanted to ask a little bit more than how long did it take you to shoot the, the actual shooting process? And also, um, yeah, just the shooting process. And then I'll ask you something. Um, the, the shoot we shot, you know, again, for an independent film, it was a lot of days. It was like 29 days, uh, I think, uh, 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 which was quite generous. And then um, we did eight days of reshoots a year later because, I, you know, the film wasn't really... The script wasn't really in the best of shape when we shot it. I was a little impetuous and didn't listen to people. And I was like, I think it's ready. And we shot it. And then I had to rewrite a lot of it. We, we, we shot for eight days a year later and uh, really got to fix the film. But it was great because I, I got to put a lot of insight back into the film. Yeah, it's, it, I, I had no idea. That's one of the things that I also love about this film, it just felt very like you were on a ride, you know, you kind of felt like the person driving in the car and you're, you're seeing all of these things. Um, is there anything else, like what were some of your favorite or the most challenging scenes that you felt uh, or like the most challenging aspect of telling the story? I know that you mentioned it's also somewhat of a personal story, but um, even, you know, some advice you felt like you learned from making the film. Um, well, you know, I had a great uh, uh, Mexican cinematographer, Chuy Chavez, that had shot a, a Mexican in the me movie called El Bulto and another one called, called Bienvenido, Welcome, that were like, they're, they're like little gems of, of 1990s independent Mexican cinema. And uh, he was a very experienced. He grew up in a cinematography family, his father's cinematographer. And so he taught me one of the main important things about being a director. I was very concerned, where do you put the camera? And I didn't know, I'm comfortable with the actors. I would set up a scene, and, but I would be telling the actors in terms of the staging and the blocking because the camera. And then Chewie took me aside and said, Miguel, I just don't, don't worry about where the camera goes. I just don't believe any of this. Do you believe it? Do you believe what they're doing? Because I don't believe it. And he helped me understand, oh, my main job is to help actors set it in motion and step back, yeah, empower them to make it lifelike and, and real and, and, and carve all those details that make you believe it. So 
uh, my job is to make sure I create a situation where the actors are empowered to make it really believable, that I can stand back and say, okay, I believe it. Now let's figure out how we shoot it. And, uh, um, you know, even in a movie, uh, even in an action movie where you're like, everything has to be pre-planned, I think that aspect is really important. The first most fundamental question when you're on a set and you do a rehearsal is, do I believe it? And I learned that from Chewy. That's beautiful. Yeah, I think that's great advice. Um, uh, Nicole? Oh, did you want to way, um, something I wanted to say, if you look carefully in the movie, you know, when we did the reshoots, Douglas Payne was like, uh, I needed a couple, I had lost a couple of the Starmuck kids. And so I needed to find a couple of new ones. And Douglas was, well, I have a friend that just got into town who I think is going to be a great actor. Would you, would you, uh, 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 would you would you bring him? And it was Michael. Um, Pena. Yeah, so it's Michael Pena. And I think a, a nineteen-year-old Michael Pena. If you look carefully in the reshoots, where they're like having uh, the kids are having food in the back alley. Yeah, um, the McDonald's, right? Yeah, he has his first uh, lines in a film there. That's in, yeah. I noticed that. I was like, oh, this is like the youngest I've ever seen him. Um, that's awesome. That's so great. These are, I think these are the fun parts of also watching some of these films. Um, like, you know, Mi Vida Loca, even you see Salma Hayek for the first time. And yeah, uh, yeah I, I just really thought, but also one of the things I love so much about the film is that, of course you recognize some of the faces, but I love when I also don't, you know, because I think it allows the story to be told in a way that it's, I'm not thinking about who someone is. It's just very true to, to this character you're developing. And I feel like the same thing um, through Pepe, it, it, he, you always felt like there was a, everybody in the film, you felt like it wasn't necessarily maliciousness, which is, I think a very, beautiful thing to talk about because the damage we have as humans and then the damage we put onto others is often something that's unaddressed and I think when someone becomes very aware of that and they play into that you lose the humanity and you lose the compassion and understanding because even with Teresa the mother you know there is a she is you can tell that Maddie's just locked in and I think um and she's not resentful and it's uh it's really beautiful. It's really beautiful. So, I mean, I'm, you know, obviously a huge fan. Um, well, you know, uh, uh, John Renoir, the filmmaker, not the, not the painter, uh, the filmmaker had a great quote, which said that the tragedy of life is that everybody has good reasons for what they do. That's, that's the real tragedy of life. And I, I, I always, my, I always, when I see just a, a villain that's just a villain, uh, it usually is disappointing to me, you know, like uh, uh, I, I like to try to understand how they themselves don't think of themselves as a villain, you know? Um, I think that even the most evil, awful people find a way to sleep at night, you know? So, um, so that, that is important. And in terms of casting a name or not a name, you know, I had great advice from uh, uh, one of the pioneers of indie filmmaking, uh, Sam Fuller, I got to meet him. And he said to me like, listen, cast your neighbor or cast the biggest movie star in the world. Doesn't matter but cast on hunch, you know? And I think that it, that is the thing to, to think about, you know, like a character in a movie has to speak to you and a character in a movie is, is, has a purpose in a story. You always have to come back to story. You're telling a story and what that characters um, will do in that story, you know, there's only specific people that can play that, 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 that can affect your story that way. It's not, you know, not, not everybody fits. Uh, they, they have a very specific purpose for your story, every character. And so you have to, you know, it doesn't matter how famous or not famous they are. I mean, that's a way to advocate with the powers that be sometimes where they're like, um, I just put a star in it. And like, sometimes it's good to, uh, to sort of make a point of saying, yeah, but you know, uh, the person playing this part has to move the story this way and, and they have to have these qualities innately and like, uh, and that person doesn't have them. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I, um, 
I do feel like you, the hunch thing is such a key thing. And I, and I agree with you that it doesn't really matter as long as you get that hunch. And that's what I would encourage filmmakers to also follow is not only the hunch of when you're uh, casting, but when you're writing, which is, I know something you really uh, believe in and, and you can see it and it's such a joy. It's such a joy to watch. Um, Nicole, you have a question, right? Are you there? Hi. Yeah. Um, so if anyone has any last minute thoughts or questions, you still have some time to put it in the chat, but um, I had a question about the music. I loved watching this the first time and I loved watching it the second time. And I think this time I noticed more of the soundtrack. I just, I guess I just really loved all the music. And there's like a song or two by like La Portuaria, which is my dad's favorite band. And I was like, how did I not notice? So I was just wondering if it was mostly your music choices or like how that helped construct, you know, the world of your film and how that came to be. You know, uh, Lisa Flores, who is it, who plays Maria and who was a musician, she didn't, uh, by the way, her, her boyfriend at the time, this guy Machete, who was a rapper, came to audition. Everybody told me to audition him. And he was too nervous to audition by himself. So he said, he said, okay, if my girlfriend comes. And it was one of those, you know, typical things where he, he was good, but I was like, how about her for the sister? And, um, but she had great, great musical ideas since she was in the music scene here. You know, she knew all the bands in LA, you know, Elvis uh, and X, she was friends with all those uh, early punk rock scenes people. And, and she knew a lot of the Latin American bands too, uh, uh, rock bands. So she brought some of it. Then my friend, Joey Waronker, who's the drummer for Beck nowadays, had a lot of ideas. Like he suggested Rachel's, which is a weird chamber music punk band from, from, from Louisville that does some of the piano stuff. And, and then when we saw the film at Sundance, we had the, uh, the luck that um, uh, Geffen Records bought, uh, you know, wanted to do the soundtrack. And so um, you're working with him, Tony, um, in, in Daisy, uh, your music person. Uh, is, uh, anyhow, he's a legendary person in the, in the, in the music industry. Uh, he he helped us, and also the, the main DJ for KCRW, Chris Doritas, helped us uh, uh, find all those bands. And then the, even better, they put us in touch with um, Gustavo Santoyala, who's won a couple of Oscars now for uh, uh, doing soundtracks for like the the, uh, the Reverend and uh, a few of other other uh, movies. But he, he was young, but he, he came from a punk band in, in, in the 70s in, in Argentina. And he was really excited. He, re, he produced Lisa Flores' song that plays at the end. And he introduced me to a lot of bands that I, you know, like there's a band called Los Piojos that is like a punk band from the 70s in, uh, uh, in Argentina. And then there's a bunch of upcoming sort of, uh, you know, rap bands that are in there that later on became much more famous. But uh, I'm really proud of the soundtrack, you know, between Lisa and Gustavo and Chris Doritas and Tony, um, what's his name? Oh my goodness, uh, um, we'll get his name. Anyhow, they, they, I had so much backup to create a really beautiful soundtrack. Uh, someone is asking if it's Tony Visconti. Oh, I wish it was. Oh. <laughs> that would be different time. Killing me. Uh, uh, if you just go, um, you will you will find it. It'll come to me, yes. Um, <laughs> but uh, 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 yeah, I'm really proud of the music. We have all kinds of. Uh, uh, and by the way, a CD was put out there you can get, and uh, and it has Berg. Tony Berg. Thank you, Tony Berg. B E R G. Um, he uh, he was a legendary A and R guy. Uh, and he's still, he's producing now uh, music, yeah. He has that beautiful studio in the Valley. Yeah, he owns, oh. uh, he owns one of the legendary studios in the Valley now, he's still doing it. But uh, uh, Gustavo was, I mean, what a, what a luck to be working with a, with a young Gustavo Santoyala and his partner. Awesome. We have a couple questions now in the chat. One is from your niece, Ellie, who also says hello from Brooklyn. Um, and she's asking about the soundtrack as well, we just covered, but also the score. Was that, I guess, anything else to add about like creating the original score? Well, I mean, uh, Rachel's, this band, 
has a lot of the piano stuff, but I also, I'm an incredible fan of Jonathan Richman and the Modern Lovers. Uh, I, I became obsessed with Jonathan Richman in the 80s when I was a young kid, and I became a groupie. I play, saw him play hundreds of times, and I really wanted him to do something for the film, so I contacted him and said, would you record something? And he's like, I'm recording in Glendale. If you bring a, a monitor and a v VHS of the movie, I'll play for an hour or something over the film. And so I literally went over with a monitor and a VHS over there, and there's a there's a scene where Carlos is coming through the dark house to find his sister in the middle of the night. He doesn't know what's happened, what's happened. And a beautiful classical guitar is playing. And that's that's Jonathan Richmond just watching the film and just literally just playing along with it. And there's there's a couple of things that Jonathan did for us like that. And it was um, it was such a joy for me. And plus I got to go out to lunch with him which was like, uh, and the way he, he uh, picked lunch places was great. He's like, I've been touring the world for 30 years. I know how to find a lunch place by instinct. Just drive, I will tell you when to stop. And we were just driving in Glendale and he was like, stop. That hole back there, I mean, it just looked like a big like, like dance hall or something. And I was like, that's not a restaurant. He's like, let's go in there. And sure enough, it was like an Armenian dance hall that, that had food. And they were, they were like, you want food? We'll give you food. I mean, we had the most incredible lunch there. I could not believe it, how, how he had that sixth sense on how to do that. The hunch. We keep coming back to the hunch. Yes. <laughs> That's the theme. That's amazing. I love that so much, that image of Jonathan Richmond and Carr. Um, we have one last question that's from Paul and Lisa, who are from EPFC, but they're up in Vancouver. So they wrote, can you speak a little bit more about Los Angeles, Los Angeles itself as a character in Star Maps? How has your relationship with LA evolved personally and creatively over the years? Um, well, uh, uh, you know, as a person, a 25 year old arriving in Los Angeles wanting to be a filmmaker and I, you know, I'm, I'm a film geek. I love the all black and white movies from Hollywood. I still, I'm, I mean, the, you know, I, I I dropped out of school in order to watch those movies, you know, like uh, uh, that was my education. Um, so uh, when I came to Hollywood, I was really, you know, the glamour of just being here was, was tremendous. Uh, and so uh, it was exciting for me, you know, like I, the, my first day I arrived here, it was, it was the 20th anniversary of Beyond the Valley of the Dolls at UCLA. I, I drove really fast in the desert in order to make it. I made it just to the Q&A and, uh, you know, got to meet Roger Ebert and Russ Meyer and like all the cast of, of that film. I could not believe my, I was like, I'm in heaven. This place is just fantastic. Uh, but uh, uh, as I got to see the city more and I got to see how segregated the city was, I realized this is a complicated place. It's beautiful because people come here with dreams and people with dreams, like all of us, are really damaged people for the most part. We have something to prove. There's some revenge that we're holding against a parent, a relative, a, a bully at school that we're trying to prove something. But in that, in that pain and in that trying to prove and strive for your dreams, there's something really beautiful about Los Angeles. But it really makes up for a city of very messed up people. Uh, uh, and yet there's this whole other side of the city, which is people who've been here, you know, they're, everybody's always weirded out when I'm like, what do you mean your grandparents were born in Los Angeles? But you know, there's plenty of people uh, that, uh, whose parents are from here and, uh, and it's the Latino community is one of the, the main communities that has that kind of roots with, with LA. And I'm still saddened by how divided and how uncelebrated uh, it is in, in Los Angeles, but I'm, I'm hopeful, you know, uh, that a Latino Renaissance is coming in television and film, you know. I, I, feel, like, I feel like we're on the cusp of uh, people understanding, you know, uh, Latinx uh, uh, is a helpful term because, you know, we're so many different cultures. It's like, uh, it's like 36 cultures, I believe, and it, it's like Europe. It's like if somebody said, like, we, are, we can only talk about European X, you know, like, uh, and, and everybody would be like, uh, why don't we have the Latin, the, the Italian guy just play the French guy? 
you know, or like what's so confusing about the like, you know, Swiss guy eating some pasta? Like, I mean, it's like all those kind of issues, like uh, uh, American and European uh, nations don't have that sensitivity towards uh, Latinx uh, because we're so many cultures, but I feel like that's all changing and, and we're getting to see the finer details of it. You know, I got to cast uh, uh, Edgar Ramirez, who's from Venezuela, in a kids movie with Jennifer uh, Garner last year called Yes Day. And uh, Netflix, they didn't even, they were like, oh, great, this is actually helpful. Please, let's do it. And so only I had three Latino kids in that family. And it ended up being a humongous plus. Like people in, uh, uh, I could see the response that people were happy that we were sensitive that he was from Venezuela, not from Mexico. Edgar's from Venezuela. And, uh, uh, and it was hugely appreciated. It's amazing just, just making that difference uh, of having that sensitivity, how, how much people, people want it. And of course, the world is becoming smaller. You know, Latin Americans are a big part of the viewership for all these streaming center services. So we, we have a shot. If you're out there and listening to this and you're a, a, a Latinx filmmaker, uh, it's a good time. Get in it. Awesome. This has been so great to hear. I really enjoyed hearing the two of you speak. You both know so much and I love talking about LA and movies. It's just so great to hear these stories. Um, so yeah, we have no more questions, um, but this video was recorded, so it will be here on the YouTube if anyone wants to watch part of it again later if you missed the beginning. And just thank you both again so, so much. Um, it's so great that many people got to watch Star Maps this week and Thank you both for being here and having this discussion. Um, well, thank you, Nicole, very much for picking the film and asking to do this. It's, you know, the movie is uh, 24 years old, so you can imagine how pleased I am that anyone wants to talk about it. Uh, uh, and uh, thank you for, for picking it and putting it all together. And to Echo Park Film Center, you guys are amazing. And Mariana, thank you so much for taking the time to, to uh, moderate the conversation. It's such a pleasure and so I appreciate your talent and everything you do. And I wanna tell people she's performing tonight. You can see her uh, 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 remotely uh, uh, at the, the Actors Gang studio. Um, can you tell us a little bit about when, when that is and how people can find that? Thank you so much. Um, yeah, and, I, and I'm, it's such a pleasure to always talk film with you and Nicole, thank you for having me. Um, and tonight, yeah, we are performing We Live On. It's an Actors Gang production. It's what we've been working on during the pandemic. We took a little bit of a break. Um, we started working on it when all this started over Zoom. We took a little break, we came back to it and it's stories of survival. Um, so please tune in if you can, you can get more information at the Actors Gang. Uh, and, or if, if you're on Instagram, go to the Actors Gang Instagram. It's all over there. You can get a link in the bio and it's pay what you can tickets. It's all donations. It's, it would be an absolute joy to have you guys there. Tell us a little bit about who, who you're playing tonight or what it is based yes, on. I get to give voice to Dolores Huerta, who is obviously an icon, uh, of an incredibly tenacious, powerful woman uh, who co-founded the union with Cesar Chavez. And, Miguel and I have always been very passionate about talking um, and sharing her story, and it's been incredible to be able to do so. It's directed by Tim Robbins, um, so please come and hear us. It's a lot of fun. Yes, if you have any interest in, in, in LA Latin X history, uh, Dolores Huerta, I mean, it's like we have like our, our, our own Martin Luther King still alive with us here. She's a remarkable woman. She has like, I think like over 10 kids or eight kids. I'm yeah, not, 11 kids. 11 kids. And she managed to run a whole movement uh, uh, at the same time. She's 90 and still doing it. Uh, and uh, uh, co congratulations for uh, uh, paying tribute to her. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank All you right. so much. Thank you, everybody. Bye Take everyone. care. Bye-bye.